Okay. So, uh, guys, why don't you just uh, introduce yourselves and then uh, you feel free to get started. Um, I can start off if you want. Uh, my name is Israel Burl. I'm a senior civil engineering student. Um, I'm Lauren Romeo, and I'm also a senior civil engineering and economics student. Uh, I'm Marissa Matalis. I'm a senior civil engineering student. I'm Tim Davis, and I'm also a senior civil engineering student. And my name is Vincent Wong, and I am also a senior civil engineering student. Um, all right, so um, I can get started here if you guys want. Um, so as Derek explained, um, throughout the academic year at UConn, our senior design project has been to provide design modifications for uh, 14 different intersections within the town of Weathersfield. Um, so senior design project is kind of like a capstone project that's lasted the duration of the academic year. Um, we've all been working on it together um, and it's, it's taken up a good amount of time every single week um, throughout senior year. Um, and we'll be answering questions throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use the raise a hand feature. Um, if you don't, uh, if you don't want to use a raise a hand feature, you can just chime in and we'll answer questions when we're done with each uh, intersection that we're going over. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. So um, like I said, we're given 14 different intersections within the town of Weathersfield. Um, you can see these highlighted in yellow on the map. I know it's kind of small, but um, yeah, they're, they're dispersed pretty well throughout the town. Um, all right, <clears throat> so the primary objectives of the project were to increase pedestrian safety, allow for a more walkable and bikeable transportation infrastructure, and to assess necessary maintenance for the given intersections. Next slide, please. Um, so the first, intersection of interest um, is that of Jordan Lane and the railroad tracks. Um, for reference, Jordan Lane is a small side street that's right off the Silas Dean Highway. Um, so it's over by the O'Reilly and the um, gas station over that way. So um, the current issues that we saw with this intersection were, uh, first of all, vehicles are not consistently obeying stop signs um, in the approach to the railroad tracks. Uh, secondly, speed limits are often exceeded on Jordan Lane. And then third, uh, the sidewalk on the north side does not connect across the railroad tracks. Um, and then finally, um, chain link fencing and vegetation make the intersection visually unappealing. Um, so next slide, please. Um, okay, so the, the big things that we outlined for this intersection um, were first of all, we wanna connect the sidewalks. Um, I put that in teal. There's the two different visuals for that. So just kind of connect those over the railroad tracks. Um, Another modification that we recommended was um, adding flashing LEDs to induce more consistent stopping at the railroad tracks. Um, and then next, um, adding two 25 foot wide speed tables to reduce, reduce the speed of vehicles on Jordan Lane um, kind of helps in the approach a little bit. And then the last thing we had was clearing and grubbing the area adjacent to the southern sidewalk. Um, so um, the total costs for this intersection looks like it's going to run us between 30 grand. 35 grand, um, the sidewalk is sanctioned being the biggest part of that, which is about 32% of the total cost. Um, does anyone have any questions about this one? What exactly is the speed table? Um, yeah, so the speed table is like, it's about six inches tall um, and it's, um, they're looking like they're gonna be about 30 feet long, 25 feet wide. And they help, uh, it's kind of like a really long uh, speed bump, I guess. I, um, it helps slow the, slow the speed of traffic down a lot. To, the, add, the... to add to what Israel's saying, it's, it's much more, it gets up to the same height as a speed bump, but it takes a lot longer to get up to that height. A full third of the total length on either side is spent ascending. So it's a gentle enough slope that plows don't get just destroyed when they're trying to go over it in the winter. And the point of it is that it's still an elevation change so that drivers are concerned and feel the need to slow down so that they don't hit the bump and catch air. But it's not something that'll destroy snowplows in the winter or be act of act any actual danger to anyone. Does it have a texture, um, uh, you know, with ribbing on it, whatever, so that people are aware they're driving over it? The, the preferred method? is to have like 
reflective warning signs next to it and to have white painted arrows on the driver's side because the ribbing makes it less structurally sound and is more expensive to install. Interesting. Um, so if there's no further questions, we can go on to the next intersection. Okay, so intersection two, this is Wolka Hill Road with Cotwell Drive and the Weathersfield High School driveway. And the first issue that was pointed out and is clearly visible in this uh, visual is the crosswalk across Wolka Hill Road is skewed. This is a concern because cars on Wolka Hill Road tend to speed by, which makes sense since it is a long, wide and flat road. And the longer crossing distances just means that pedestrians are, are exposed to that you know, traffic stream a lot longer. And so there's a greater risk of getting hit by a car. Another concern is that the corner radii on Cotwell Drive and on the Weatherfield High School driveway, which I have outlined in red, those are just, those are quite large. And that also makes the crossing distances of there bigger than necessary and also allows cars to make right turns in and out pretty quickly too. And then the last concern that we noticed on our two site visits were that there were ramps that were either sinking and pooling water whenever it rains or they're just too steep in general. Next slide, please. And so in the, on the street view, uh, if Marissa could hit. So those are the two ramps that I noted that have issues. The one on the far end is the one that's sinking and collecting water. And the one on the near end is the one that's too steep and would need to be regraded. And then hit again, Marissa. And then I'm just highlighting here that the crosswalk is skewed. And so we should probably fix that. Next slide, please. So proposed improvements. First things first, we, I want to straighten out the crosswalk across Wolka Hill Road uh, and put in a new ramp to accommodate that as well as putting in a pedestrian crossing island. So the crosswalk would be eight feet wide as per Weathersfield standards and the crossing island would be at least six feet wide per the Federal Highway Administration's standards. If you're not interested in this. Next animation. It's interesting. Yeah. It's just I also propose a 15 foot corner radii, mountable corner at the Weathersfield High School driveway. So mountable being that it can be driven on. The 15 foot radii is just so that cars can make it around, make it around the driveway and enter without riding on the corner. But we also wanna make it drivable because school buses do use that entrance and they're gonna need more than 15 feet to be able to make it into the driveway. Mm -hmm. Next animation. On Cotwell Drive, however, that is a primarily local road. And so it's mostly cars that are gonna be there. And so what I propose instead is actual curb extensions. So we're gonna reclaim pavement and then we're gonna plant grass on top of it. And then the 14 foot radii is just so that car, it's just enough for cars to make the turn in and out without hitting the curb. Next animation. And then as I've pointed out, those two ramps that are problematic, those will need to be replaced. Next animation. And then once we put in the straightened out crosswalk, we no longer need the skewed crosswalk. So we would need to get rid of that so that people don't continue to use it. Next animation. And then to further promote bikeability in Weathersfield, we propose to put in share rows to, to inform drivers to please share the road with bicyclists. Next animation. I put it on low. I mean, and, it and so all of this all is estimated to cost between 65K to 80K. The mountable corner ended up being the most expensive portion of this. And that's most likely because it's, re it's really big relative to all these other stuff. I think the crossing island is more important and that's going to be 30% of that total cost. Next slide, please. And so and on this zoomed out picture of intersection two, we actually have bike lanes on Wol Wolga Hill Road. And the reason why I chose to stop it before that intersection is because the road, the width of Wolga Hill Road doesn't change, um, but the number of lanes do change. And so right where those bike lanes end and essentially turn into share rows is where the road goes from two lanes to three lanes. And we, we wouldn't be able to fit in a bike lane without reducing the lane widths to less than 11 feet wide. And that's not 
really desirable. So that's intersection two. Any questions, comments, or concerns? For the, great. Uh, for the pedestrian islands um, painted or are they raised uh, asphalt curved islands? Yeah, they're, they're actually granite, granite curves. They're gonna be raised six inches off the ground and in, in the middle of the island, it's going to be stamped concrete. And also two signs warning drivers to please keep to the right. I, I'll just comment how necessary this is. This is around the corner from my house. We, they are literally employing two uh, crossing guards during pick up and drop off now because it is so um, crazy with cars, kids jumping out, kids running across. Um, it, it all happens when people, it, it hasn't been as much lately, but as people are leaving for work. And so it, it's, a, it's a hectic, hectic scene there that's really in need. This is, uh, you know, I applaud the plan here. It's, um, it, it's, uh, it really is called for. Thank you. What were the costs again for this one? Uh, Sixty-five to eighty thousand dollars. So eighty thousand dollars would be adding on a, a twenty percent for maintenance and also contingency. Okay. All right. If no more questions, we'll move on to intersection three. So for intersection three, this is located at Wilkie Hill Road and Knott Street. Um, and when we were there observing the intersection, we noticed, um, well, one of the first issues is that it's an offset intersection, which um, needed to be adjusted so that the north and southbound approaches would be straight through. Um, and also in our experience there, we had a lot of difficulty with crossing the road um, and imagine that a lot of other pedestrians experience the same. Um, due to the heavy amount of traffic and also the road width, um, which is exacerbated by the offset intersection. Um, and then some other issues were the drainage um, on the northern side of the intersection um, on Wilkie Hill Road, and also that some of the ramps were too steep. Um, next slide, next slide, please. Um, so the first change that I proposed was um, curb extensions, which are shown in yellow. So these would reclaim space um, from the road and um, turn into grassy area. And in addition, these would also um, realign the road so that the intersection is no longer offset. Um, and then in, in addition, they, as I said, since the road space is reclaimed, um, this also shortens the crossing distance um, and makes it a lot safer for people to cross and then um, keeps vehicle speeds relatively low by um, making those um, turning radii a little bit um, smaller. And then um, going along with that change, we would need to realign and create new crosswalks. Um, so as you can see in the middle of the intersection, there is a currently an existing diagonal crosswalk that would need to be removed um, and then replaced with four straight crosswalks. Um, and then in order to make this intersection accessible to bikers, um, we propose implementing bike lanes on all of the approaches. Um, and one thing to note, um, as shown on the south side of the intersection um, on the southeast corner is a proposed future bike path, um, southeast corner, yep, right there. Um, and this would be a 12 foot bi-directional bike path. So um, its location off of the road would provide um, a much safer biking route for um, people who choose to use it. Um, but we understand that since there's um, a cost associated with this, it is probably, it might not be feasible at this time given the other necessary changes. So this is something that we're recommending for a future improvement. Um, does anyone have any questions on this intersection? With the bi-directional path being uh, later on, which makes sense, uh, is there space for bike lanes uh, in the near term? 
Yeah, the the road would still um, have enough space to have, um, I believe I put four foot or yeah, four foot bike lanes and then it would still leave 12 feet of space for um, cars traveling in each direction. Any thoughts on going to 11 feet with travel lanes? Um, I, th I personally um, think that's fine. I know in our conversations with, um, with Derek, he was recommending um, 12 foot lanes, um, but I think that 11 feet is certainly sufficient um, if you wanted to have more space for um, bikers and having like five foot lanes instead. Yeah, Kevin, we, uh, and that was discussed. I mean, that, that's an option. Um, I think at the time I was thinking we'd look at the 12 foot lanes, just given the volume of traffic, bus traffic we have through here. Um, but that's certainly something we can look at when we get to a further design. Sounds good. I'm actually thinking more of, of trying to slow the traffic than I am worried about the width of the bike lane, but both would be good. Yeah, I definitely think that, um, you know, reducing the lane would be an effective way to slow the traffic. So I guess, um, you know, considering the volumes that would have to be taken into account in the future, but um, yeah, and I think it would be great if eventually the bi-directional bike path could be put in, because I think that would really help increase the volume of bikers using the intersection. Well, what were the costs for this project? So it's estimated um, 50 to 60,000, um, but this isn't including the bike lanes since they're um, like proposed future improvements um, and the, the implementation would need to be um, figured out um, more thoroughly. Okay. Looks good. Thank you. And if there's no other questions, we can move on to the next intersection. Okay, so the fourth intersection that we're looking at is Willow Street and Glenwood Drive, uh, which is right across from Webb Elementary School, which is seen on the west of this aerial right here. So this is actually one of the intersections in town that has a crossing guard that somebody mentioned earlier, just because there's high amount of traffic on this road. And that's even worse in the morning when you have a lot of people dropping off their kids in the afternoon when people are picking up their kids. Um, so there's a lot of pedestrians and a lot of traffic and traffic can go very fast on this road. Now, another issue on this intersection is that like the one near the high school, there's a slanted crosswalk, which further uh, extends the length of road that you need to cross in order to get to the other side. Um, and then in terms of the issues with the sidewalk here, you can see I circled in yellow. There's a section of sidewalk on, Glen, uh, on Willow Street that abruptly ends and doesn't continue until it hits uh, Well Street further up. Uh, lastly, there's uh, two ramps here on Glenwood Drive that don't meet ADA requirements. They uh, exceed the minimum slope, uh, the maximum slope, and they're missing pads. So our proposals for this are to replace that old crosswalk with two new crosswalks. Um, further down down the road so that we can straighten it out and reduce the amount of feet of road that people need to cross, uh, as well as put in new ramps. And also put in new ramps where uh, the current ones that are non-ADA compliant are as well as a new crosswalk there just for more visibility. And then lastly, to connect that sidewalk, which accounts for the bulk of the cost of this project. 
because it's about 600 feet of sidewalk. It goes all the way up to Wells, Wells Road. Uh, so that's of the 50 to 60,000, we estimate this project cost, that would be about 72% of it. Uh, does anybody have any questions on this one? We can uh, is there a, oh. a, a question about the crosswalk on Willow Street. I think it generally looks very good. I, I'm wondering if there's a general engineering train of thought, whether uh, let's say the crosswalk going across Willow was moved uh, north. So it's aligned with that sidewalk that's an entrance to the school. That would move it away from the driveway, which maybe has an advantage, but it, it also moves it away from the corner of Glenwood. So I don't know if there's any thought on distance from a from a uh, from an intersection that's ideal for crosswalks like that. That that was um, my original design for this. Um, Derek suggested I move it down. I'm not sure what the reasoning was, though. Yeah, Kevin. I mean, usually, I mean, it's it's there's different options and there's pros and cons to both. But generally, uh, we try to keep it close to the intersections so more visibility. Um, the concern I would have would be someone coming out of Glenwood looking to their left, taking a right quick, and then being on top of someone. So. You know, we've talked about some of the uh, like DOT intersections where they've pushed the crosswalk yeah. pretty far around the corner. They're harder to see. Um, so that was just a thought at the time. But, you know, then again, this is, um, you know, these are thoughts and we can we can further evaluate them when we get further in the design. So that was the reasoning at the time. That's cool. I know exactly what you mean by moving it farther from the from Glenwood. Uh, the driver won't, you know, won't tend to see the person crossing. Will Thank any you. of these intersections have uh, pedestrian lights that they, uh, you know, are there any lights, overhead lights that, uh, you know, for pedestrians to walk? Um, I know in this intersection, there's a street light uh, right next to where that ramp is proposed. You can see the shadow of it on the aerial. Yeah. Um, is that what you mean? Yes, yeah. So that the kids crossing can push a button and go across or anybody. Oh, yeah, we, we suggested that for some intersections, not this one though. Um, I'm just, just thinking of pedestrians that are there not during school hours, but kids going to play uh, soccer or play at the school or whatever. Um, going to the football fields, the baseball fields, and uh, they may be crossing the street in big numbers. Yeah, I yeah. Think you're, you're, you're referring to are the uh, our RFB, the rapid rectangular flashing beacons where you could push, you could push a button and have a flashing signal. Um, DOC oh. has uh, standards oh. for when those should be installed based on traffic speeds, traffic volumes, um, crossing distances and such. Uh, so in the, a lot of these instances, they just they just aren't warranted. Um, but as was mentioned, there are a, I think a couple of locations that we they were recommending them. We did talk about it that maybe it would make sense at certain ones. So yeah, those are those are good to consider. I just think in this particular location, we just didn't have the traffic volume needed. Yeah, and then uh, just a comment real quick on the. I, I don't actually mind that those that the crosswalk is further. It's closer to the intersection. Because when we do this for DOT, um, especially for state roads, the idea of moving it further away, especially on some of these single lane roads, is to allow potentially one car, you know, to get out of the way. Let's say if you have, um, if you don't have concurrent phasing, um, or if you have concurrent phasing, and uh, but most most of it's being deterred because you have um, exclusive ped phasing, but. I, I, I don't mind the crosswalk in that location. Okay, I'm going to move on to the 
next intersection. So is any other questions? So intersection five is Town Line Road, um, which is by the Rocky Hill Town Line, by the south end of town. Um, and it's the intersection with Mountain Laurel Drive, which is the apartment driveway to the north of the aerial, and the shopping center, which is the driveway to the south. So the issues here are that there's a high potential pedestrian and vehicle traffic. And it's very difficult to cross these to uh, the sidewalk that goes through the driveway of the shopping center and the slanted sidewalk that goes towards the apartment. Um, it's also near our bus stop, which you can see the, the bus on the aerial um, right below the town line. Uh, while, while we were here, we found we had a lot of trouble crossing the shopping center just because there's a lot of cars turning in and out. So you really have to look out and it's a long crossing. So it's a little scary. Um, the other issue here is that there's a lack of any ramps. So the slopes are exceeded and there's no pads for crossing. I, I included these pictures here just to show where those catch basins are that cause the crosswalk to be slanted. And then I took a picture of this truck that was stopped on the on the crosswalk because we noticed that a lot of times people turning into the shopping center will stop on the crosswalk while they're waiting to turn. So our the changes we want to make here are, first of all, to extend the curb and replace this with grass uh, to a 30 foot curve. 30 feet should be plenty for um, trucks and large vehicles to turn into. If you remember the intersection we were talking about before um, with the high school, those radii were 14 feet, which is more suitable for a passenger car. So these are still a lot larger than what you would need just for cars. So it should, it should be fine for the traffic that goes through here, but it still is enough to cut 10 feet off of this crossing here. Currently it's 50 feet with these curb extensions, it will cut it down to 40 feet. And in addition, in addition to that, we want to put in a crossing island here to provide some refuge uh, for people trying to cross here. Because like I said, you can see the car right here. People can take that corner sharp and it can be, even with that um, island to the south, it's still very dangerous to cross here. Uh, we're planning to remove the slanted crosswalk there and move it a little further down, uh, as well as add new ramps. And this is one of the intersections that we're considering the RRFB, which is the flashing beacon that is pedestrian activated. And that will alert cars coming in either direction that somebody's trying to cross. So those RFBs, uh, a set of them, including installation cost, is around $22,000. So that's responsible for most of the cost in this intersection, uh, even with all these curb extensions in the island. That's still the most expensive thing. It's estimated to cost about forty dollars to $50,000. Uh, does anybody have any questions? One thing I would mention in this is um, the grade, the grade between Town Line Road and the entrance into the shopping plaza is so steep for, you know, where the red car is in your image. That transition causes at least uncertainty with motorists turning in and out 
which which kind of causes some backups. Um, I don't know if there's any any way to smooth that out, but that could make some motorist movements a little bit more predictable, especially for pedestrians. Yeah, I think I think something like that would need to be done like the next time the road is redone. I, I'm not really sure how that would be done because I think that would require the like the vertical alignment of the road to be adjusted since like the entire road is sloping down. That's yeah, definitely or, or something to consider. Or it could be handled with reconstructing a portion of the driveway. We'd have to lower that concrete sidewalk that crosses it to provide a better profile coming in and out, um, which obviously would add to the cost. But that's a you know another option to to help the uh, help with safety here. And honestly, if you're doing something that drastic of a change, part of me wonders if it would be better to not have the sidewalk crossing the driveway and instead have a painted crosswalk that might be more visible. The only reason I didn't suggest that is because that would be a large change to the road and I wasn't getting into like actually redoing the road. These smaller turn radii are really good. Uh, would you consider going with a quote unquote car, uh, a tighter radius for cars? Because there's a separate truck entrance uh, to, the wet, uh, to the west behind the shopping center. I think here it might be possible to do something like in Vincent's intersection where there, there were mountable corners. I, I'm hesitant just because I know there's a lot of truck traffic in this area, but yeah, that's, that could be a possibility with the mountable aprons. Honestly, the, um, the reason Kevin Tedesco mentioned the slope of the apron there is so steep uh, most drivers, you know, kind of need the larger turn radius to kind of angle their car to get to get in. So in that sense, would it not be smart to cut it down any further? Yeah, yeah. So what you have is it's a, it's a considerable improvement and it might be a good compromise. How's that for giving you confusing feedback? <laughs> Okay, uh, I think I'll move on to the next intersection. How about the bus stop on Tonlon oh. Road? Um, any thought? I don't know exactly where that bus goes after it picks up from that location. Would it make the intersection less congested if the bus stop was moved uh, to the west, just a little bit uphill to the to the left side of the picture? I know that I, means coordinating with CT Transit too. Yeah, I think you would also want to provide some sort of uh, sidewalk yeah. or refuge up there if you were to move it uh, to the west, because currently there's nothing on that side of the road. Uh, Kevin, there's a whole backstory. There's a whole backstory to the bus shelter. Um, uh, we had we had tried to get the property owner to agree to a bus shelter at that location and they would uh, not even consider it. The uh, right of way is very uh, narrow. So the bus shelter would have to be on private property and the ah. uh, condominium association there uh, just would not entertain it. We even talked to the owner of the office building a little bit to the uh, east uh, as well about another option and uh, they would not consider it either. So, okay. But we would love to have a bus shelter there. And just for the record, you know, we, we included this intersection just given, you know, how high profile it is, although this is technically Rocky Hill. Um, the town line is just north of the uh, northern sidewalk. So technically, you know, I've spoken with them. They were aware we, you know, the students were looking at it and uh, we can give them some feedback on it. Um, but it is outside of Weathersfield. 
Well, they should definitely do the full depth reconstruction then. <laughs> I, I will say I walk there a lot to uh, to the shopping center, and that um, that cross where the cars are coming out. There's a sidewalk there, but the cars they they're oblivious to that. There's people walking on that sidewalk. They're not really even I don't think looking. So. I, I'm not really, I'm not sure of all the terms you're using, but if making that more of a crosswalk sidewalk might bring the attention. Yeah, like where that car is turning, people turn in there without being aware that people are walking on that sidewalk. Um, but I like, like the change. A, how about a raised crosswalk to slow, you know, kind of like put the crosswalk on top of a speed hump kind of thing? And like spikes that could come up if they're going at a certain speed or something. <laughs> well, I, I like the idea of howitzers mounted on the, the side of the road, but um, yeah. And moving that, because that sidewalk ends on the other side of the street, you have to cross at a very, it's, it's uh, you, you really can't even cross there. That's, you either need to continue across where there's no sidewalk and cross up where the truck entrance is. Um, and there really isn't any sidewalk over there either, but that it's less traffic turning at least. So I, I like everything you have here is really much, much improved. But yes, let's get Rocky Hill to make some of the payments. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to move on to a little bit further down the road. Uh, if this is west of the intersection we we're just looking at, at the end of Townline Road, um, Charter Road and Townline Road. Charter Road is going north to west, Townline Road is going west to east. That red line is the Rocky Hill Weathersfield Town Line. So this time, this time we're actually in Weathersfield. Um, the issues here is that for uh, earlier on Townline Road, that sidewalk just abruptly ends, which you can see in the picture on the right. It just it just leads to a bunch of trees. So mm -hmm. that's there's no no cross uh, no crosswalks here. There's no sidewalks here at this intersection. So what we're proposing is to first of all, connect that sidewalk up to Charter Road so that it doesn't just end abruptly and put in a crosswalk and ramps. That's good. We would need to also move the stop line ahead so that it's an appropriate distance from the crosswalk. And then this might be a project for another day, but we're proposing that a sidewalk be added to Charter Road just on one side for now, uh, just because the amount of use it would get. Currently, there's no sidewalk along this entire stretch. It's about one mile uh, all the way up to Maple Street. So this is the most expensive intersection that we have in this presentation, but that's mostly just because of this mile worth of sidewalk and all its associated cost with the excavation and uh, the actual materials needed for the sidewalk and the labor. So this would be 90 to $110,000. But like I said, the majority of that cost is from this sidewalk here. Without that sidewalk, the, the sidewalk connecting Townline Road to Charter Road and the ramps and the crosswalk aren't as much, won't be as much of a cost. Uh, does anybody have any, any questions about this? I have a question about the sidewalks. Um, it's my understanding that when sidewalks go in, the property owner. Can you, no. Can you ask that, Cornell, can, Bridge? Can you hear? Um, 
when when sidewalks go in, is it not the property owners that are responsible for paying for the sidewalks? And how does that figure into that ninety thousand to one hundred and ten thousand dollars? I think that the cost they're providing is, you know, if it was to be constructed, the cost as far as how it's paid, um, you know, there's different ways of doing it. A lot of times the abutting properties would be assessed and they would pay for it over a period of time. Um, that might come back to if it's something that a uh, you know group of neighbors got together and they want the sidewalk. If it's something the town is want, wants to do, then it may be handled differently um, than if it's something they're requesting. So. That's, I think the cost that they're providing are just what total cost is, and then it'd be different options for getting that fund. Is it less expensive to put the sidewalk on the west side of Charter Road? I, I didn't look into the, the, like, the comparison because this is such a rough estimate, I wasn't looking into like how much like tree excavation and regrading that would need to be done. So I think okay. that would be need to be further investigated. Yeah, also so the, there's the utility price. poles on the opposite side, on the east side of the road um, going up there. So oh, that gosh. complicates things too. So the cost calculated are basically like linear feet of sidewalk and not like how steep the slope is and other challenges like that. Yeah, we we consider like the amount of asphalt that would need to be repaired, like going through driveways and the ramps that would need to be put in when you're intersecting streets. But it wasn't in depth as in like how much how much earth excavation you'd be doing and how much cut and fill you'd have to do and like relocation of utilities and signs that we didn't we didn't go that in depth into it especially because it was outside the scope of the intersection which is our our main focus that's cool thank you I'll move on to the next intersection. Um, so the next intersection is Wolk Hill Road and Cumberland Avenue. Um, and we noticed that there were um, on the Cumberland Avenue, um, the right side of Cumberland Avenue. Oh, wait. This is um, mismarked, just so you know. I accidentally put Nod Street instead of Cumberland Avenue on the map. I can adjust that later when we send this off to you. but. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, the so on the right side of Cumberland Avenue, there is a um, green median um, between the uh, uh, east and westbound approaches. Um, there were kind of large curb radii um, on the intersection with Wolga Hill Road, so we just um, thought that those should be changed. And then also some crosswalks were missing and. Um, some of the ramps were cracked, uneven, and steep. I know that there was one that was not ADA compliant. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so we first um, created some slight curb extensions on the, the median on Cumberland Ave. Um, and these would bring it to 15 foot uh, curbs, which just slows down the turning movements a little bit. Um, and then we also wanted to put in bike lanes, especially because this area is um, part of the bike route um, that Weathersfield has um, in place for the town. Um, I know that there's like a, a map that depicts like where the bike route goes in the town and I know it goes on Cumberland Avenue. So by incorporating the bike lanes, we figured that this would fit well into the existing network. Um, and then again, there's a proposed uh, future bike 
path that would go through that grassy median and then um, straight through um, and carry alongside the sidewalk that leads to the school nearby. Um, and so then this again would just um, provide a more safe placement for um, bike traffic. And um, in addition, we just placed new crosswalks um, at this intersection. Um, and then also new curb aprons, um, especially, um, which were especially needed at the places that had um, too steep of um, uh, curbs. So, does anyone have any questions about this intersection? Any thoughts on making Cumberland two, making Cumberland two way and, and eliminating one, um, one of the roads, so to speak, at least for a section of Cumberland? Um. I'm not sure how that would work since there's houses on each side of the road. And I, I do think that the median, um, in my opinion, is good because it um, has a like physical separation and it um, can slow down traffic by, you know, being between the two, like the two different um, sides of the road. Um, so I think that it's a good feature. Um, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on um, your rationale behind like removing one of the roads. I think you're on mute. You're right, thank you. Um, simplifying the intersection overall, I think it was the goal, but you may be, you may be right. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a good feature. Um, but yeah, are there any other questions? Um, if not, I think we can move on to the next intersection. Okay. Um, so the next intersection we have is that of Walker Hill Road and Genrich Road. Um, so the current issues that we're facing with this intersection is uh, one, there's no crosswalks present on either Genridge or Walker Hill Road. Um, two, there's no accommodation for cyclists. Three, uh, there's poor grading that's caused localized flooding in the intersection. Um, and then the last major issue is speed limits on Walker Hill Road are often exceeded, deterring pedestrians from crossing. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this one's pretty simple. How we intend on addressing these problems is uh, adding in bike lanes along Walker Hill Road. Um, and then we added two crosswalks, one on Walker Hill and one on Genrich Road at the locations in purple right there. And then the last issue was um, that we wanted to fix was regrading the roadway to allow for more effective drainage. Um, so that's that gray triangle right there. There's kind of a big dip right there and um, it, it jams up pretty bad with the rain. You can, the picture on the top right is, a, is literally just standing water on the middle of the intersection. So hoping to regrade that. Um, and the total cost for this intersection is between $6,500 and $7,500. Sidewalk and grading accounts for about 35% of the total cost. Um, are there any questions for this intersection? I've got a question. Uh, Genrich serves the, um, the school there. I forget the name of it now. Um, and traffic uh, can be a cluster there with uh, people trying to take a left turn on the northbound lane of uh, Wolcott Hill. Um, I thought I had heard a couple of good ideas. I don't remember what they are now about how to better manage the, the traffic flow there and the multiple driveways that exist for the school. I don't know if that was looked at as part of this, like maybe changing the uh, what's used as entrances and exits for the school. Um, that would be outside of the intersection, correct? Like more on Genrich Road over to the left? Uh, uh, yeah, to, to uh, consider something like that. Yeah, it would come out on Cumberland. 
Um, yeah, to be honest with you, we, I didn't go that in depth on this intersection. Um, the primary focus here was, um, I understand what you're saying though. Walker Hill goes really, really fast. Um, we looked at some yeah. options for slowing down uh, flow of traffic there, like putting in speed tables or race crosswalks or stuff like that. But um, I don't think it's going to be incredibly practical just because um, of the current speed limits that we have there. And yeah, so. Thank you. Um, any other questions? All right, um, next slide, please. So next intersection we have is Knott Street and Yale Street. Um, so the primary concerns we have with this intersection is there's no crosswalk across Knott Street. Uh, Knott Street is, it, the flow of traffic is really fast there. So um, the speed limits often exceeded and that was another issue that we're trying to address. Uh, furthermore, there's no accommodation for cyclists. And then uh, lastly, probably the big issue within this intersection was that the convenience store on the bottom left corner of the picture, um, it has a lot of asphalt, asphalt for um, property frontage. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what, um, what I'm recommending that we do for this intersection is continue the bike lanes along Nash Street um, and then replacing the asphalt with sod around the convenience store. So that's highlighted in teal there. Um, it, it would just make it look a lot more visually appealing. Um, and then next was putting in a, cro a crosswalk across Knott Street in purple right there, and then adding in the ADA pads um, to, to comply to the standards. So um, the total cost for this intersection is between $10,000 and $15,000. And the biggest part of this is gonna be replacing the asphalt with sod, which is about 42% of the cost. Um, I consider that very important, the sod, because I have frequently gone down Yale, and I will tell you that there are other people who get the parking lot confused with the uh, driveway, with road. Yep. yep. And the other issue is that people can kind of just pull out wherever they want to on Knott Street and Yale Street. And um, what, what this visual allows for is two areas, um, one on Knott Street, one on Yale Street where they can exit. So it's a little bit more predictable for honestly, anyone, bikers, walkers, um, you know, people in other vehicles. So uh, any other questions for this intersection? For, for the crosswalk, I think the, 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 there's probably a need, if you're going to put a mid block crossing, you're likely um, going to want, especially with the volume and speed on this road, um, you'd probably want to look at uh, an RRFB as well. Um, yeah, so we looked at RFPs. Um, I think Derek said that that wasn't the, the best way to approach this intersection. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. Um, yeah, like we said, I mean, there's, I, I think we had looked at it from DOT's normal standards and it, it didn't meet it, but, you know, there's a lot of these locations that could be an option. Um, I think the sight lines are pretty good approaching here. And, uh, you know, I think we did, we were proposing one maybe down the road a little bit that might be coming up, but, you know, all these things are, are things we can consider once we, once we take this, these designs further. Cost always comes in as a factor as well. Um, you know, none, none of this is funded at this point, so we'll have to find a way to, to get the funding to, to do the work. So just something to consider. Um, any other questions? All right, um, keep moving on. So this is intersection 10. It's uh, Knott Street with Follybrook Boulevard and just south of that intersection where you can see in the dotted lines in the aerial photograph, that's actually a bike trail, um, part of a designated bike route uh, through Weathersfield. So first known issue here that's uh, clearly visible is that the crosswalk is skewed. Th this is a concern again, because Knott Street speeding is not street, cars tend to speed by, and that, that really just makes crossing there pretty challenging. And also you're at risk of getting hit by a car. Uh, second issue is that there is one ramp that is too steep and then two ramps that are just missing the bumpy ADA pads to warn uh, blind pedestrians that they're entering the road. 
And lastly, crossing that street is challenging simply because of the skewed crosswalk and also speeding. Next slide, please. And so Google Street View, uh, can you, Marissa, can you please hit? So again, highlighting the crosswalk is skewed, uh, hit again, and then highlighting the two ramps. Uh, so near one, too steep and missing the pad, and then the far one as fine, the slope as fine as is, it's just missing that pad. Next slide, please. All right, so proposed improvements. First of all, we should definitely straighten that crosswalk and then put in a new ramp to accommodate said crosswalk. Next animation. So our FBs, they're typically not put at intersections, but we we feel that since this is a dedicated bike route and there's going to be bicyclists and pedestrians using it, that it would be a good idea to put them in there to help with the crossing. Next animation. And since we're straightening out, out the crosswalk, we should also realign that bike trail using stone dust so that the new crosswalk meets up with the old, with the new bike trail. And since we have the new bike trail, uh, next animation, we no longer need the old bike trail, so may as well just plant grass over that so that people don't continue to use it. Next animation. So bike lanes on along Knott Street and Follybrook Boulevard. So. The ones on Knott Street are five foot wide and the ones on Follybrook Boulevard are four feet wide. And these widths were just proposed uh, just to give like the biggest bike lane possible while maintaining a lane width of at least 11 feet. Uh, next animation. Uh, the ramp that's too steep, steep will need to be replaced. Next animation. We need to get rid of the old crosswalk so that no people won't continue to use it. Next animation. And we need to get rid of the, old, the ramp that's uh, currently there so that people also don't try to use it as well. Next animation. And then right now there's fences along that bike trail that should be removed so that, so that the new bike trail can be used. Next animation. So all this is estimated to cost between $40,000 to $45,000 and our FBs, as Marissa mentioned, on average, they cost $22,000 to install, including the power source and all that. And so that's going to be the bulk of this at 62%. Any questions on intersection 10? I think we need that. Just thinking about the bike path and how dangerous it is across Knott Street, I would consider that a very important ingredient. The straightened crosswalk and the uh, RRFB. The signals, the yes. Oh, the yes, signals. the RRFB. Yeah, all right. No do other the RRFB, um, do yes. the RRFBs, uh, just out of curiosity, do the RRFBs require uh, an underground connection or do they communicate wirelessly and they're just powered individually, if that made sense? Um, e e yes, there, it can either be hardwired or it can be solar, solar, power, um, solar powered uh, units available. It's just a matter of which, which one would, would uh, the town prefer to install here? But yes, both are possible. And the cost is about the same? Yes. Cool, thank you. All right, uh, moving on to intersection 11. So intersection 11, this is actually to the east of intersection 10. Um, <clears throat> right, right now, this this is a mid-block crossing. It's located, um, located on house number 341. Although after, after the improvements, the crosswalk is gonna be moved. But anyways, the current issues is that the crosswalk itself is pretty old, it's faded and these spaces are quite, the spacing is, isn't quite right either. Uh, the signs, the signage that is there is pretty old and outdated and should be replaced. There are missing pedestrian crossing ahead signs. So typically at any crosswalk, there would be there would be a pedestrian crossing sign at the crosswalk, and then there'd be another sign 200 feet away in both directions, warning drivers that, hey, you're approaching a crosswalk in approximately 200 feet. Uh, Not street encourages speeding, and yeah, crossing this crossing this is would be challenging, and we can expect that there will be pedestrians using this crosswalk because 
the sidewalk that's up to the north is actually to access the Weathersfield Community Center. Next slide, please. So street view uh, animation. So right now this crosswalk is utilizing uh, people's personal driveways um, as opposed to actual dedicated ramps for the crosswalk. Next animation. The crosswalk itself is pretty old and the spacing between the white bars is quite excessive. Next animation. And I'm just highlighting here that the sign itself is pretty outdated and it's not reflective anymore. So it's, so visibility is kind of, is pretty difficult. And then next animation. And then I'm saying further down the road, not just on that end, but also on the other side of the road, we're gonna need a, need a pedestrian crossing ahead sign. Next slide. So proposed improvements animation. Uh, we're going to move the crosswalk away from 341 and put it in front of house number 345 and put in dedicated uh, ramps for that. Next animation. I'm also proposing that we replace those signs with something newer and also putting in the vertical strip on that sign as well, just to improve visibility. Next animation. <clears throat> Since this is a mid-block crossing as opposed to a intersection, uh, our FBs are possible here as well. Next animation. And then pedestrian crossing signs ahead uh, need to be put 200 feet away on both sides. Next animation. So we're, we're planning to put bike lanes on Knot Street anyway, so I just put them here. Again, they're five feet wide so that we can maintain a lane width of at least 11 feet on Knot <laughs> Street. Next animation. And then of course, once we put in the new crosswalk, we won't need the old crosswalk anymore. So we should get rid of that. Okay. So this is all expected to cost between 30 to 35K and our FBs, they're the most expensive component again at 77% of this uh, intersection. Any questions on intersection 11? A question for Derek. Derek did, uh any of these intersections make it into our uh, submission for the DOT RRFB program? Uh, I'm trying to think, I think so. Um, I wanna say the high school driveway that we talked about earlier was. Um, I, I think there was one along Knott Street. I don't remember off the top of my head. And I think there were the rest of them, I think we had five in total were some existing crossings that we were looking okay. to put them in. Okay. So there's some potential to get some funding for a couple of these. Yeah, the state solicitation from a few weeks ago was to, they were looking for interest um, as far as what municipalities might be interested in it. So it's it might be something that's coming down the road that we can put in a formal application to. Okay, thanks. All right, if there's no other questions, we'll move on to intersection 12. All right, so intersection 12 is an intersection with uh, state run and owned railroad tracks. And again, the big issues on this road are that vehicles don't stop to check the railroad tracks and they <laughs> combine that with excessive speeding and it's just dangerous for most vehicles on the road because they don't have time to check for the train if it's coming. And then if the train is coming, they wouldn't have time to slow down. And then also, as you can see here, sidewalks just kind of end and strand pedestrians in the middle of the street without actually finishing anywhere. Next slide, please. All right, so as you can see in, in the top image, I just wanted to emphasize the A, the red circle demonstrates the, the sidewalks just kind of end, leaving people hanging out to dry. And then you can see that the town has put up all kinds of railroad crossing and stop and train approaching signs because people speed through and don't stop. And it just, it hasn't been working effectively so far. And the reason that that's a problem is you can see on the bottom half of the slide, there's a lot of shrubbery and vegetation on either side of the tracks. And that makes seeing the oncoming train difficult, especially if you're speeding. Next slide, please. All right, so again, in orange, the orange squares, we wanted to use speed tables to encourage people to slow down based upon multiple elevation changes as they're coming up the stop line. And hopefully they're getting slow enough that they'll just stop at the stop line and actually properly check for the train. And we want to rectify the sidewalk just kind of ending. That's the yellow line across the top. It'll connect to an existing sidewalk on the corner of Mill Street 
at the intersection with Middletown Avenue down to the east of this. And then because we're going to be cutting through a lot of people's driveways in blue, we'll need to be repairing driveway aprons. And finally, of course, we'll need to warn people that there will be an elevation change or two. And that's it. The warning signs will be reflective and placed at the beginning of the signs so that people have adequate time to prepare themselves and slow down. So the entire cost of this intersection is between 80 and $95,000. The driveway aprons, because there's, there's a lot of square footage to repair and cut up there, and there's a lot of driveways, that's about half the cost. The sidewalk extension is another 20%. And the speed tables are not actually that expensive. They're less than 15%. Are there any questions? Uh, one one more thing I want to add in about this intersection and the other railroad one. Uh, something that we consider is the railroad gates that are sense the train coming and close down yes. when the train's coming. Uh, the problem with that, that <laughs> Tim, you can continue. They are those are several hundred thousand dollars per side per intersection, which is much less feasible in terms of cost to the town to install. And the speed tables have the additional benefit of actually getting people to stop, well, to hopefully get people to stop speeding and to stop at the stop lines consistently instead of only the rare occasion when there's actually a train coming through. So it'll just improve safety conditions to at all points to all drivers and pedestrians using the road and not just the rare occasion when something's using the train tracks. Are there any questions? Yeah, just as an aside, the, the town the town could probably engage the railroad, which is Genesee and Wyoming, that you know, maybe they could team up for a federal grant, um, you know, like an infra creasy grant, um, something along that lines. Because uh, yes, the cost is is extremely high for those. Um, but the quality of life with the gates would be a lot better with uh, with <laughs> rather than without because there's slow orders now so the train can't go more than 10 miles an hour through um through this area and they have to sound their horn at every single crossing so it's something to look forward to um, i know there's a lot of federal grants coming out just as an aside as i live right on the railroad track i appreciate the 10 miles per hour and I would not appreciate the fastness of the train going through through a heavily um, uh, density. It's a dense area of people living in those houses, and it would detract tremendously from Old Weathersfield. Meanwhile, I, I living, I can look out my window at that intersection, and uh, I have to say, even though people don't all stop at the stop signs, what a difference that's made on the street having them you know having those stop signs and if you put those uh bumps in there that would be great and then of course finishing that sidewalk it's a very heavily used sidewalk people go up to the uh corner uh to all the shops up there uh and people at the shops go for a walk during the day at noon time so uh if we if we could get that sidewalk that would be tremendous But those Are the uh, speed tables built so they cross the entire road to keep people from crossing into the opposing lane to get yes. around going over the speed. Okay, thank yeah. you. Anyone else? All right, we'll move on then. So intersection 13 is Mill Street and Middletown Avenue, and this is just down the road from intersection 12. Intersection 12 is just to the west of this. So the known issues here are that, again, you can see in this aerial, the sidewalk stops and are disjointed. There's no crossing walkway for pedestrians. There's a lack of warning pads on the crossing for pedestrians. And the large turning radii mean that people can go faster than is ideal through these turns rather than stopping and letting people go. Next slide, please. So on the top, again, the red circle is just to highlight that there are existing lengths of sidewalk. They just kind of stop at some points and that there's a very wide curb radii. And again, the bottom, the existing sidewalk that is 
stopped right at the edge, the far edge of the railroad, it it could connect very easily, but there's just an, a stretch of no sidewalk there. Next slide, please. So the proposed improvements are first and foremost, we need to create a, cro a crosswalk and pedestrian ramp so that people can cross safely and have some legal way of doing so. And we want to ensure that those ramps and pads are ADA compliant uh, because that's a, another issue that we found when we went out and inspected these, a lot of the old, uh, ramp slopes don't meet ADA standards for slope and don't have inspecting pads. And then we want to, again, decrease the corner radius to slow people down as they're going through that curb, hopefully encourage them to let pedestrians go when they're using this. And again, we want to connect the sidewalk that runs along Mill Street, and we also want to connect the bits of sidewalk that run north-south in this image along Middletown Avenue. So the estimated total cost is thirty-five dollars to $40,000, and the sidewalks are responsible for 43% of the total cost and then restoring the lawn areas alongside of that just because it's a lot of stretches of individual sidewalk going up and down Middletown Ave. That's another 17%. Mm. Does anyone have questions? Oh, I would just say that the MDC did put a pad at the end of that sidewalk. Yes. Since then, but, but yeah. as you say, no crossing and then no sidewalk on the other side either. So. Yeah, that'd be great. We could do that. Would you normally advise to shorten the turn radius on the southwest side there? Um, that isn't strictly necessary for this intersection because the point is to get people to slow down across where the crosswalk will be. So it's safer for pedestrians. Uh, we could spend the money in time but it's not, it would be a quality of life improvement, especially to get people to go slower through the right turn there. But in terms of just the scope of this, making it safer for pedestrians to walk through intersections like this, it's not strictly necessary, but it, it would be good for the same reasons that the one is suggested. Is Thank there you. enough space for a bike lane? There is enough space for a bike lane. The road, these roads are all in excess of 35 feet wide. So you could fit a bike lane of a, at least four feet on either side of the road or a wider one on one side of the road and still have 11 foot lanes. That'd be tremendous too. <clears throat> I ride that at least that once. Was that in reference to Mill Street or Middletown? Middletown. Uh, Middletown, yeah. Uh, Mill Streets also would be wide enough, but the problem there is if we're installing speed tables and having people ride over the railroad tracks, that gets a little more difficult just because of the elevation changes. But yes, every road is legally wide enough to do so. Cool, thank you. All right, are there any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, so we'll move on to the last intersection 14 at Highland Street and Collier Road. So the biggest problem with this is that the stop line on Collier Road is far too far away, over 40 feet away from the, the actual travel lane in Highland Street and this causes a great deal of visibility issues to everybody trying to use this turn and also the angled crosswalk as you can see here is longer than it has to be or longer than it would be if it was straightened and the ramps here are not adequate to existing ADA standards. Next slide please. Again, the top of this slide is just to emphasize that, especially in the summer, there's a, a total lack of visibility with where the stop line is on Collier Road. And the bottom is just to emphasize that the small ramp that's circled in red there is only three feet wide and at a slope that's barely ADA compliant, doesn't have a warning pad, the crosswalk is angled and we can easily make pedestrians using this intersection we can make it easier for them to do so. Next slide, please. So the big one is if we move the stop line 15 feet forward, that'll 
drastically increased visibility of people trying to turn onto or off of Collier Road. In fact, while we were out collecting measurements, we'd watch people stop with their entire vehicle over the stop line in order so that they could see. So this is just moving the stop line to reflect conditions as they exist now. I also want to decrease corner radii. The one on the right-hand side of the intersection image here isn't strictly necessary, again, because that's not where people are crossing. But the one on the left is because, A, this gets people to go slower around the intersection, and B, that also gives you a little bit more square footage to run a, a crosswalk to so that you can straighten out the crosswalk there, as you see in orange, and remove the old one and that's in red over white so that you can people be in the road less. And finally, we want to replace the existing ramps because again, the one on the bottom of this image is just not in any way, shape or form ADA compliant on the top one is old, cracked, doesn't have a visibility pad and wouldn't actually be on the road anymore because we're extending the corner there. And this one, this intersection is actually fairly cheap. It's only between eight and $11,000 and the the ramps, curbs, and sign replacement or new installation are each 10% of that. And then another 30% is the uh, uniform traffic control officer making sure that the workers are all safe while they're doing any improvements. Does anyone have questions? Is there enough road width on Highland to um kind of bump out the curb farther south, uh, south? Yeah, south, uh, so to shorten the pedestrian distance across Highland? There is enough uh, technically legally, but this is a very high use intersection by uh, school buses because there's a school just down the street and by like garbage and snowplow and et cetera. And if we did that, we could, the turning radius would be less than the legal standard for those larger vehicles. So we could do like, again, like the intersection that, so that Vincent and Lauren were talking about in front of schools, we could do uh, mountable curbs and get a bump out. And so that hopefully cars don't go over them, but larger vehicles can. But given uh, this road, it, Highland Street, the width of that is, it would be a little, little tight. Thank you. Is there room for a bike lane on Highland Street as Highland Street is part of the Heritage Way bike path? There is room for a bike lane on, you could, you need to do the minimum, the four foot bike lane. If you wanted one on both sides, you could have a wider one on one side, but Again, yes, there is some room. This is not as wide of a street as the previous ones, though. So you can't put like, this isn't like a 45 foot street width, like some of the ones Lauren had. So it's not quite as spacious so that you can just install new things. But yes, there is room for one wide one or two narrow ones. Anyone else? All right, next slide, please then, Marissa. So this is just an overview of the final cost with and without contingency. On the left, you can see that we expect these improvements to run for about $533,000 without contingency or insurance or any other additional features just the improvements themselves. And on the right, we expect the improvements plus 20% total uh, vehicle protection and insurance and et cetera to run for about $640,000 in total for all 14 intersections. And there's an itemized breakdown of the without and with contingency of each intersection. And this is the last slide of actual information. We do want to say thank you to Derek Greger, Peter Giuseppe, and to our UConn advisor, Dr. Lowndes, for making all this possible and for working with us throughout the year and for always having such great advice and being understanding with us as students. But we also wanted to say thank you for 
all of you for coming out and seeing what we have to say and all of your great comments, because it's nice to talk to people who might actually have to live with these improvements. Great, well, thank, yeah, thank you. you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you guys. Nice job, everyone. Appreciate all the effort you put in this past year and, um, you know, certainly got some good information out of it. And, uh, you know, some of these improvements are easy enough and cheap enough. We can implement even if it's partial improvements until we can get funding to do more extensive work. But, um, you know, definitely be helpful for our planning purposes going forward. So nice work. Thank you. And actually, one thing I just wanted to mention that came to mind was, um, for some of the more ma major changes, like with um, Curve Radii, for example, um, I would suggest using quick build, um, like temporary installations to kind of test in certain places. Um, those are really cheap ways of uh, kind of getting those ideas out there and seeing how they improve the situation first. Um, so I think for a lot of the expensive ones, that's a good like temporary mechanism. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Excellent point. Wasn't one of the members of the team uh, said that they were an economics uh, made by, you know, a minor or something like that? Could that person help us figure out how to pay for all this stuff? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm a dual degree student in civil engineering and economics. Um, so, but civil engineering is my, prim is my primary major. So I don't know how much I could help you with the, the payment plans, but <laughs> any help? Totally answer your question. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you. Thank you very much for all you did for us. Much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> Gives us hope. <laughs> Plus it's budget time. So now we have some numbers to work with. Yeah. Okay, uh, the only other thing um, was just a quick uh, overview of some of the uh, pedestrian and bike projects that we're working on uh, at, the, at the present time. Just a couple of updates and then Derek, if I missed something, if you wanna jump in. Uh, we, uh, we did have a uh, robust meeting with the DOT about the maintenance of the proposed Putnam Bridge Trail. Uh, I think we made some, made some progress on that. We've got a follow-up meeting uh, coming up uh, shortly with the DOT to try and hash uh, some of those things out. The meeting included Glastonbury as well as uh, Weathersfield representatives. So we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, Derek, I think we have confirmed that the public information session for the community connectivity grant program projects uh, are scheduled for Wednesday, April 28th. So uh, if people want to mark, we've moved that date, I think now three times. So I think we're gonna have to stick with this third, uh, third date. So if you wanna mark your calendars, uh, Wednesday, April 28th, we will uh, have a Zoom meeting. We will share the latest uh, drawings. Uh, we have tweaked a few things, uh, added a few things. So we wanna make sure before we go forward uh, that the public has an opportunity uh, to weigh in on those. Um, the third thing is we're happy to announced that the town council uh, voted to support submitting uh, the Heritage Way bike path uh, for a Connecticut Greenways designation. That is due towards the end of the month. Uh, Kevin, is that due the 30th of April or before that? Uh, it's due April 30th and we would find out the Friday before trails weekend, I understand. Okay, and that's in the fall, I think. Oh, uh, that's no, June. First week. First oh, week yeah. of June. Yeah. Oh wow, that's a quick turnaround then. I thought I saw something about October first, but um, that's good to know that it'll be sooner than later. Yeah, that October first is an old date. They haven't updated the website. Okay. All right. That's why I saw that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, we'll continue to work with uh, Bike Walk Weathersfield to get that. Uh, get that submission uh, filed by the by that deadline. Uh, the last thing I have is I had a meeting with the uh, Weathersfield Historical Society. Uh, they have um, been able to tap into some 
uh, pro bono landscape architecture assistance, and they are interested in pursuing a, an AARP grant that would allow them to uh, make improvements to the uh, trail that runs behind the Keeney Center out to um, Broad Street, and also uh, a proposed trail that would connect uh, the Keeney parking lot with the uh, parking lot for Lucky Lou's. Uh, so they are um, pulling together information that might allow them to submit a grant application to do that. So uh, we've offered our in-kind services to the extent um, that it's uh, necessary, uh, but we'll keep you posted on uh, on that. I think that uh, that those projects were recommended in the old Weathersfield master plan. So the, high, uh, the historical society is, is taking those on uh, for themselves. So uh, maybe at, at, a, at a point in time when they have some plans, uh, we'll have them come in and maybe make a presentation. That's it for me. Uh, Derek, do you have any updates on the other projects Peter, that you're working on? Peter, could I just ask a question about the uh, scope of the uh, community connectivity? Um, are we talking more than just the bridge? Are we talking with, with Rocky Hill and Hartford and so forth or? No, the, the community connectivity grant projects that I'm mentioning are the ones that we received uh, funding for several years ago. Uh, we've been working uh, in the interim on the final designs of those. So Derek has moved some of those designs a little farther along than they were the last time we okay. shared them with the public. So it's all of the old projects um, such as improving the intersection of Maine and, and Hartford. Uh, Maine and State. Oh, uh, right. Okay. Yeah, Garden Street uh, and the playground and the parking improvements down there. So it's all of those projects. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, with regard to some of the other projects, um, just an update on the lesson. Uh, I just heard from our contractor for, on Highland Street. Uh, he was delayed a little bit, but as far as I know, they should be out there next week to finish putting in signs related to the new pedestrian crossings that we installed. And mid-May, they'll be out to um, redo some of the line striping and to finish some line striping they hadn't done yet. So that project's um, winding down. Um, they do have some restoration work and other things that are typical. There was a late season project, but um, that's almost done. As far as uh, Wolka Hill Road reconstruction, um, our consultant did submit it to Krog about a month ago for preliminary design. Uh, we had a meeting with Krog and their review consultant last week. And um, at this point, we got some, some feedback on some of the work. Um, one of the things that uh, potentially could delay it is we, are, we got some funding from the DECD, about $500,000 for installation of streetlights. We're finally getting close to a final contract with them, um, but the, that's taken longer than we thought it would. So at this point, our, our consultant is still working towards final design. Hopefully we can get that contract in place and get started on the lighting design as well. Um, at this point, we're still shooting to put it out to bid uh, sometime over the summer, uh, most likely with a fall start. Um, the cost of the project and the scope has increased quite a bit. Uh, I don't remember if I mentioned it last meeting, but they did find that we had a lot of clay soils out there. So um, that's added probably about 25% or about $700,000 to the project between that and some other improvements that have been made. So it's likely that this, later this month, I'll have to go to the transportation committee and uh, just seek approval for the additional funding, um, which is typical with these types of projects when you get into design, um, you find things that you weren't expecting. So, and that's still moving along and I'm hoping to get it started this year. That's all I have. Okay, very good. Um, are there any other matters that anyone wants to bring up or questions, comments before we wrap up tonight? Okay. Peter, I wouldn't mind a minute mentioning bicycles on Maine. So uh, everyone's uh, heard of and seen scarecrows on Maine. Uh, the old Weathersfield shopkeepers uh, are now this May, for the whole month of May, going to be doing bicycles on Maine, decorated bicycles in instead of scarecrows. Um, and the main reason I wanted to mention it is if anyone is interested in decorating a bicycle for this event, there are free bicycles available, limited supply, uh, and they're going to be given out uh, this coming Saturday 
April 10th at the Keeney Center from 10, 10 a.m. until 1 p.m. Uh, and if you can't make that, uh, people can contact me and we can arrange to get you a bike if we have any left. We probably have enough for just about anybody that wants one, but uh, there isn't a limit to what we can provide. Thanks, Kevin. How, what's the goal? How many bikes, bicycles are they hoping to be able to install? Uh, they're talking about a goal of 50. Wow. I don't know how that compares to scarecrows, but um, I think we have probably at least 30 bikes right now that are available. And I know some people are providing their own bikes. So I'm hoping we can get to that 50 mark. Okay. Good luck. And you're going to be out Saturday, right? Uh, Saturday, Saturday with uh, the bikes. Correct. Yeah. Saturday, ten to one, at Kenya Center. If you can't make it, give me a call. I'll get I'll hook up with you another time. Yeah, I have a bike, but I want I haven't seen it yet, so <laughs> I'm trying to get a look at it before before Saturday. <clears throat> Jim, you're making me sleepy. You look way too comfortable. Well, I, I was sitting on a hard chair before, <laughs> so now I'm uh, compensating. Okay. All right. Anything else for the good of uh, the order here? Okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, and thanks for uh, dedicating your time today to listen to the UConn students. I think they, uh, they definitely appreciated having, uh, having your feedback. So thanks for that. And Derek, thanks for working with them. I know it took a lot of your time up and I think they got a lot out of it. Yeah, no, I think it was a good project uh, for them and for us. Great. Okay. It was awesome. Awesome to have the UConn students and great to have officer Crabtree on the line too. Peter, I have one question that's after the meeting, but how did the uh, brewery go on the PZC the other night? Uh, so it was just the new brewery regulations. It wasn't a specific approval yet. So now we have regulations that would allow somebody to, to come in and, uh -huh. uh, and do that. So um, we anticipate a couple of applications in the near future. Really? Yep. Uh, wow. A lot of action down on Main Street these days. Yep. I think we're at this point, we're one of the few towns that don't have a brewery. So I was starting to get a bit of a complex about that. So yeah, yeah. So that's good. We're going to catch up, I guess. Excellent. Okay. Uh, thanks again, everybody. Have a good night and we'll see you. Um, I think in the agenda, I had placed the, I uh, pointed out the next uh, meeting date. So we will, uh, we'll see you at that point. All right. All right, guys. Good night. Thank good night. you. Thank you. Good night. Take good night. care. Good night.